lovely stuff. Um, do you reckon we're good to go, Nicole? Is there enough participants? Great. Let's just begin. Lovely. So I guess we'll start with some introductions. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with us both already if you're part of the foundation community. Um, but my name is Hannah Lewis and I have been involved with the BDD Foundation for a few years now. I'm currently the project lead for the Structured Support Group project where we're making CBT for BDD um, adaptable in a group context. And I'm also a PhD student studying the prevention of body dissatisfaction um, with a view to um, prevent the onset of disorders like BDD and eating disorders as well. Um, and I'm very much motivated to this cause due to my own lived experience of BDD and bulimia as well. Um, and now I'll pass over to Dr. Nicole Schnackenberg, who I don't really think needs an introduction, but... <laughs> Thanks, Anna. It's really a pleasure to, to present with you this evening. So I'm Nicole, and I'm a trustee of the Body Dysmorphic Disorder Foundation and have been for quite a few years now. Um, my day job is as a child and educational psychologist and I have lived experiences of diagnoses of anorexia and body dysmorphic disorder. So that involved some inpatient treatment during my childhood and early adolescence and then later some outpatient treatment as well under the diagnosis of BDD. Lovely stuff. So if we just um, take you through the outline of the session today and what we've got planned... We're going to start today just looking at the overview of disordered eating and BDD. So Nicole's going to take us through um, some of the work that she's done and you may be a bit familiar with it already if you attended our conference back in November. Um, and that's going to be a really nice introduction to both of these disorders and where they may or may not overlap. We're then going to move on to talk a little bit about the current COVID-19 context and how the pandemic and lockdown may be affecting people's um, body image and eating difficulties during this time. Um, again, just to let you know, this is something that me and Nicole have drawn upon our own personal experiences and our own research back, but it may be that we've missed something. Um, so do feel free to... Um, participate in the Q&A or put your own um, yeah, suggestions to us. That's more than welcome. And importantly, what we're going to move on to next is looking at how we could potentially overcome some of these specific challenges. We really want to give you some pragmatic tips to help you during this difficult time. And we'll go on then to just share some sort of headline key messages to take away from today's session. And we'll end just by sharing some signposting and some resources so that we can um, work on our self-help and sort of self-guided um, recovery during this time. So Nicole, would you like to take us through the DSM and what that's currently saying about clinical eating disorders to start with? Thank you, Hannah, for the lovely introduction. And um, what we'll do is, because of the shortness of time, we won't go through all of these diagnoses, but you know, feel free to go away and, and look them up at your leisure. But just to highlight a few things, really, and there are multiple diagnoses that come under the umbrella of eating disorders. And there are multiple diagnoses of which um, eating struggles are a part, but don't come under that umbrella. And then, of course, we have body dysmorphic disorder, which comes under its own little umbrella, which is the umbrella of obsessive compulsive and related disorders, thinking about um, the diagnostic and statistical manual, which, of course, is one lens through which we can consider this. And whilst the DSM and the ICD would have us believe that these diagnoses exist in their discrete little boxes, we know, of course, it's far more complex than that. And these experiences, they overlap and they conflate. And it can absolutely be the case that you're, you meet the diagnostic criteria for parts of one and parts of another, and it really isn't clear cut. So we have some of the kind of better known, I suppose, and more widely researched um, diagnoses in, in regards to eating disorders of things like anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, which myself and Hannah have already mentioned in terms of our own stories. Um, perhaps less known is this idea of a diabulimia. So this, this kind of comes under or currently would come under this other specified feeding and eating disorders, OSFED, they now call it, it used to be um, EDNOS, I think, you know, <laughs> to make it all very complicated with the acronyms. But diabulimia is um, here sometimes characterised as 
to make it sound, I suppose, more official EDDMT1, so an eating disorder of um, diabetes mellitus type 1. So it's where somebody with a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes may be significantly reducing their use of insulin or stopping the use of their insulin as a weight control measure or to lose weight. And as you can imagine, having high blood sugar levels that would result from that can have a whole host of physical ramifications and really serious ones as well. So I take time to highlight this firstly because it's lesser known and less, lesser talked about and researched, but also because of the, the physiological implications and the fatality actually. So if, if you're a type 1 diabetic or know somebody that is and isn't using their insulin as prescribed, this really is something to take seriously and to seek support for. Um, we have binge eating disorder, we have orthorexia, and actually this is quite a common one for people that then go on to have a diagnosis of BDD to be diagnosed with, because it's this idea of restricting oneself to a narrow remit of foods. With orthorexia, with a desire for clean eating, and this isn't helped much by some of the peddling of, you know, the green diets and vegan diets and, and the sort of clean eating movement overall. Um, but it can be actually that people are only eating specific foods because they're trying to alter a specific body part. So when we think of the diagnosis of BDD and part of that being a distressing preoccupation with perceived defects or defects in the appearance that are either not visible to the outside eye or to the outside eye are seen as, normal part, as a normal part of human variation. We understand that some of the behaviours towards that might look a bit like orthorexia. So, for example, I might restrict myself to just eating soups and drinking smoothies. And if nobody asks me curious questions about the why of, around that, it could be that oh, it's assumed that I'm very much desiring to keep my diet clean and I get a diagnosis of orthorexia. Actually, it could be that my perceived defect on my teeth and I'm terrified to eat solid food in case I crack one of my teeth. But if no one asks me that, we won't know. And the reason it's important to ask those curious questions is because as Hannah and I will come on to, that will be part of the deciding factor as to what kind of support we get. So it's not so important that whatever the label is fits, although some of us can of course find that validating, but that the, the treatment and the um, support that we're then directed to is really specific to what we're actually experiencing and not to what it's supposed that we're experiencing. And as we mentioned, these um, di clinical diagnoses overlap and conflate. They definitely do. And I think just um, if I could say a word about that last category there, the other specified feeding and eating disorders category, because that tends to make people's experiences feel quite invalidated. But what's quite interesting with this uh, label is that amongst the people diagnosed with an eating disorder, it's around 50% of people who end up with a diagnosis of OSFED or the artist formerly known as EDNOS. Um, but you compare this to other psychiatric diagnoses like personality, for example, and only 5% of people with a personality diagnosis will have this other um, diagnoses. So it's quite interesting just to recognize that and acknowledge that. So, you know, just because you've been given this label of other, um, that doesn't mean your eating disorder, you know, it's, it doesn't fit the other categories and it's less valid, it's less valid or it's less harmful. Um, and I think another, just to add another point onto the orthorexia category as well, um, whilst I don't want to pathologize people's uh, choices and um, sort of ethical motivations for, for being vegan or vegetarian. It's quite common sometimes for people to use veganism um, to avoid a whole food group like dairy um, because of potential, potentially to control their weight and shape, but also because of the impact that might have on their skin. Um, so again, like Nicole was saying, you'll never really know the true motivation unless you ask the person. Um, just another example I thought I'd throw in there. Thank you, Hannah. And with all of them, and I mentioned it with bulimia, but with any 
um, part of our lives where we're restricting our nutritional intake in some way, or indeed are engaging in behaviours like purging, so getting rid of the food in some way that we've ingested, there are physical ramifications and they can be really serious. So it is to take these things seriously and to seek the support and to not um, take no for an answer really, because it's a sad state of affairs and a truth that's really unfortunate that people talk about going to the GP or going to another medical professional. They put on the weighing scales, the, the, the medical professional gets the body mass index, the BMI chart out, they're deemed to be at a safe BMI and we know that BMI is not a reliable measure anyway. Um, they're deemed to be at a safe BMI and then it's, oh, you know, you're okay. And actually that person is, is in, perhaps engaging in all sorts of aberrant eating behaviours and maybe really struggling. And the physical ramifications of that can happen at any weight. There can be electrolyte imbalances at any weight. There can be digestive difficulties. Mitral valve prolapse in the heart can happen at any weight and is a common um, ramification of disordered eating. So it's hard, isn't it? Because when we're feeling that we're struggling anyway, to then have to really stand up for ourselves and say, weighing me is not enough. Or actually, um, you know, I feel like I do need an electrocardiogram or I do need you to listen and take my... Um, my concern seriously is really difficult and that's where bringing along an advocate but also arming ourselves with research to say that these are serious struggles and that we deserve and require the help now not not three months down the line when the behaviors might become more embedded and some of the physiological difficulties might be enhanced exactly there's a very good um there's a very good resource from Beat, and we'll share the link at the end of the presentation, but they've produced a, um, a GP card that you can take with you for your first appointment at the doctor's, um, and that'll cover things like, you know, ensuring that you get not just, um, not just your weight taken, but your blood tests and your blood pressure and all those other really important things. That's great. Thank you, Julia. Um... And in terms of what treatment pathway you might end up on if we're thinking about BPD and eating disorders, it, the, the, the key thing really is the focus of the distress. So many of the underlying aspects are the same and we'll come on to that. But typically, and it is typically because it isn't always the case and there are no absolutes, but typically with a, an eating disorder diagnosis, the primary focus of the distress will be on the overall weight and shape of the body and a desire for the number on the scales to go down. And that might include things like counting calories and, and exercising to a high degree. Whereas with um, the diagnosis of body dysmorphic disorder, the distressing preoccupation is on a perceived, uh, a, a specific body part. So rather than it being on the overall shape of the body, I might, for example, be restricting my diet in an effort to change the shape of my face, as one example, or as Hannah mentioned, to clear my skin. Um, and this will send us off on different treatment pathways. However, it is possible, of course, that we're experiencing a bit of both and or one after the other. And again, that's being our own advocates and taking along people to support us to say we might need a little bit of treatment that's focused on the BDD aspects. And we might also need some input from a nutritionist or a dietitian or some family therapy or something that's going to support the other part of that experience that we're having. Definitely. And here we've just got a list of some of those similarities. Um, again, in the interest of time, we won't go through them all and um, you can read them for yourselves. But there was one that really stuck out for me here and that was the secrecy point and the guilt and the shame that shrouded both of these disorders, um, which acts sometimes as a barrier to accessing help. So just something to remind ourselves of with these conditions. And as well, as um, is pointed out at the bottom there, both have a real big impact on quality of life and daily functioning and can result in missed education and missed work. Um, and, you know, sadly, there is that higher prevalence of mortality. I think it's anorexia specifically, that's the psychiatric disorder with the highest mortality rate, um, largely due to the physical health implications, but we mustn't forget the suicidality rate attached to both of these disorders as well. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and, you know, some underlying similarities around the nervous system as well, so nervous system dysregulation, so less 
part of the driving force between a desire to alter the physical appearance might be underlying feelings of shame and might be a subscription to a societal myth really that somehow beauty and thinness and muscularity is equitable with lovability and and goodness um, but also there can be underlying nervous system factors in terms of that dysregulation of the nervous system so for example um, experiences of anxiety hyperarousal heightened sympathetic energy mobilizing um, sensations in the body and hyperarousal feelings of low mood and numbness that mean that we might go towards something like food and amending the foods we eat and amending the way that we eat to bring ourselves up or down into that space of kind of nervous system balance, that window of tolerance. And that can be a, a part of the driving force behind continuing to go back into that cycle of binging and purging or continuing to starve the self, for example, because what the nervous system does is it habituates. So, you know, I might um, restrict my diet to a certain degree and that provides a certain um, element of soothing, but then the nervous system recalibrates and now I need to restrict my diet even more for that same soothing and then it becomes a self-amplifying cycle. So it's thinking about some of the psychobiological um, roots as well as the emotional roots around relational trauma, um, developmental trauma um, and difficult experiences we know that the pre prevalence of bullying experiences is high in both of these um diagnostic categories so not to disregard that um, also absolutely and although there's so much more going on than just the common theme of distorted body image and um, as i'll tell you a little bit later that's the largely the target for prevention for both of the disorders and um, that we're talking about um, yeah, and that's what the research is saying more and more as well, which is quite interesting. Um, as Nicole went through the DSM-5 earlier, she mentioned how there is this, you know, dichotomy of obsessive compulsive disorders and eating and feeding disorders. Uh, more recently, there's been a proposal to create a new category of body image disorder, which could blend the two, which is quite an interesting prospect. I really want you to include this slide, just thinking about research, though, because historically, researchers and academics have really separated these two disorders and believe they've got two very different courses of treatment. But the, more and more recently, as I mentioned um, just then, there's more overlap and definitely more scope in terms of prevention as well to address both conditions. You see some of the similarities like visual processing differences in both of these disorders. Um, but I think one of the main things to take away is that, as we discussed it earlier, they are both severe psychiatric conditions. And I think both of these conditions are really, un like, unfortunately targeted with um, labels like being vain or narcissistic. And of course, that's not the case. Um, thinking more about mine and Nicole's own research as well, the support groups run by the BDD Foundation and the support groups as part of the structured um, support group pilot have both shown lots of our beneficiaries coming forwards with disordered eating in the context of their BDD. So it was really important for us to acknowledge that and address the needs of our beneficiaries. Um, and Nicole, do you want to tell us a little bit about your PhD study just there? Yeah, so it's a very doctoral piece of research, but um, where I interviewed at length 10 young people about their experiences of um, BDD aged between 16 and 25 and it really kind of bowled me over and it shouldn't have done because I've run support groups with the foundation for years and I've heard this narrative again and again that nine out of ten spoke quite extensively about how eating struggles were part and parcel of their experience of BDD often to change a specific body part or it could be that people felt that they, the young people felt they'd moved from one to the other. And this is the interesting thing about these experiences, because I think we can become quite um, waylaid by, as Hannah said, this idea that it's focused on a physical appearance and therefore these very big and inaccurate misconceptions that it's related to vanity in some way and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, but it, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> But um, yes, uh, so it, it, this idea that it is to do with vanity is a big misconception. Mm. And young people spoke about how 
about their underlying sense of shame, which is what came out of my research, the shame identity model. So this underlying sense of shame gets pinned onto or projected onto a perceived appearance defect. And then the safety behavior, so the restricting of the diet or the picking of the skin or the seeking of cosmetic surgery, whatever it is, is a way to somehow help the self to feel good and to have a sense of the self as lovable, safe and whole. But because even if the weight is lost or the cosmetic surgery happens and the person is pleased with it, which we know is quite a rarity mm -hmm. in the diagnosis of BCD, the underlying sense of shame hasn't been removed because this isn't about physical stuff. This is about underlying experiences so that the shame is still there and therefore the person looks or projects their, um, that sense of shame onto another body part, another appearance project. So what was the skin becomes the weight. What was a diagnosis of BDD seems to magically become a diagnosis of an eating disorder, but the, the underlying experience hasn't changed, just the um, behavior that's attached to that experience has changed. And that's where, of course, we're using language to make this accessible. And we're using words like disorder because unfortunately that's, you know, that's how mm -hmm diagnostic criteria describe them an eating disorder body dysmorphic disorder but we very much recognize Hannah and I of course that these aren't disorders in that sense they're they're an act of, they're um, an act of hope they they are a desire for order they're an attempt of the person to um, come to a sense of themselves as lovable safe and whole um, and this is where the research is really interesting because it does feel like it's beginning to recognize some of those underlying experiences and therefore to think more broadly about the overlaps between these uh, seemingly very clear cut but not diagnostic criteria. Definitely. Um, hot off the press, Glenn Waller gave a presentation at the International Conference of ED today all about reassurance seeking. And I thought that was so interesting because that is such a massive feature of BDD. And now it's being looked at in the context of an eating disorder as well. So again, just another example of how more similarities are emerging from the two camps that have been so separate in the past, hopefully are now being brought together. Interesting stuff. And this model here, um, it really is a visualization of what Nicole and I have been saying about how, how systems and um, treatment provision just isn't quite um, up to scratch and isn't quite available to meet all of our holistic needs. Um, as you can see here, when, when we were discussing this diagram, it's very much like a sliding doors moment um, just down here at the um, box at the bottom. Because depending on what you disclose to your healthcare professional on the day that you seek help could really determine which path you end up going down. And you can see here that on the left, if you know someone's deemed to have you know, more of a BDD diagnosis than disordered eating, then they're more likely to go down the IAP route and receive CBT. I think it's usually six to 12 sessions um, through the IAP program and by doing that, as you can see here on the dotted line, their ED symptoms won't be addressed. But conversely, on the right side here, if someone on the day they've gone to seek help is deemed to have um, more difficulties with their eating and food, then they'll be referred to an eating disorders service where their BDD symptoms may not be addressed. So either way, all of our needs won't be met. And me and Nicole were saying, how wonderful would it be if, you know, in an ideal world, we'll be able to sort of blend um, both of those evidence bases. So we could have, like you mentioned before, Nicole, you could have that nutritionist input, you could have that dietitian's input, as well as the CBT, the BDD, as well as some family therapy, if that's what you need. Um, but essentially, this is just to, to demonstrate how the current service provision isn't really fit for purpose, let's say, for people with this um, complex interface of body image and eating difficulties. Um, just a little, what's the word? Not disclosure. Well, yeah, a little bit of disclosure. This is something I'm working with on my PhD. So it's not validated or anything like that. That's just, some, it's just something I wanted to share with you today. That's a lovely model, thank you. Thank you. Also, just to flag um, on the top right here, where it says physical health compromised, 
due to the physiological effects of disordered eating. Really don't want that to be compla conflated with uh, severity. I think even, you know, compromising your physical health isn't the threshold you should meet to, to access help and support. You should get that regardless. Absolutely. We have to really come away from that, that model, I think, don't we? Well, just, just before we go on and think about this biopsychosocial model in the context of COVID-19, just to um, flag again that there's a Q&A box at the bottom. So, so if we have to wait till the end or anything like that, if something occurs to you in the moment, a reflection, a question, do just pop it in there and we'll, we'll make sure that if we don't come to it now, that we'll, we'll surely have a look at it at the end. Yes, definitely. Because, you know, this really is a first for everyone, isn't it? It's, um, you know, there's not a, a rule book on how to navigate COVID-19 with body image and eating difficulties. So this is something that, you know, it's very much a work in progress, um, a, dynamic, a dynamic document perhaps that we could keep adding to and working on after today. But I thought it was really helpful to look at the current situation, the current context through this biocycle social lens. Um, I think it's a really nice way to, to look at the different parts of a jigsaw puzzle and try and make sense of what you're experiencing. So for example, here, some of the biological factors that might be affecting us right now are things like tiredness, a fatigue, decline in physical activity, changes to weight and shape, as well as physiological signs of anxiety, such as an upset stomach or nausea, you know, that increased nervous system dysregulation. Looking at things through more psychological lens, there's lots of other things going on. So there's relational distancing, that increased attachment anxiety, a loss of work identity perhaps, a loss of routine, loss of control. You know, the notions of flexibility and inflexibility are at play and emotional signs of anxiety and stress will be present as well. So you'll see there may be a bit of um, blurred boundaries between these. But I also think it's really important to acknowledge the, the env uh, environmental factors right now, because this is, as we know, an unprecedented time and there's so much going on that we've never seen before. And it's a very unhelpful time, I think, for the media to be declaring a war on obesity. And um, there's some there's some flaky research coming out about the link between obesity and the impact on COVID. Um, and as you may have seen a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister you know, declared again, another war on obesity, which I don't think is very helpful language. And all of this alongside social media influencers talking about a lockdown blow up, you know, there's this pressure on us to use this downtime, use this time to really alter our appearances and come out of lockdown looking better than we did when we went in. And that is quite a, it's a balmy thought because this is a global pandemic and you wouldn't think that would be a priority. But I always, I always remind myself when I sort of get lost in this, these thoughts that the diet and beauty industry do prosper off our insecurities. So, you know, for us to feel crap about ourselves is money in their pockets, really. And of course, there's lots of memes about weight gain and coming out of lockdown, looking like you've gained weight and um, people sharing those. But I think at the beginning of lockdown, the very notions of rationing and stockpiling food and the scenes that were in the supermarket, for me, really, really reflected the two extremes of restriction binging in disordered eating. And I think that was a real you know, that was a real wake up call at how in, um, integrated these two um, problems are. And I think there was another thing as well, talking about supermarkets, about some people perhaps not being able to access some of their safe foods and some of the foods that they've been really used to um, eating and accessing for their recovery. Is there anything you'd like to add to this slide, Nicole? Well, I'm just thinking some of these ideas and how damaging like something I've heard is the quarantine 15 you know this idea that you're going to come out of quarantine 15 pounds heavier and and you're right Hannah how then that can play on our insecurities and is money in the pockets of those people selling us whatever it is that we're told that we need in order not to gain that weight during COVID-19 and I suppose of course it's a lot more complex than this because that social is just one aspect of all these different 
um, prongs, if you like, that can lead to an experience like a struggle with eating or perceived appearance defect. But um, it, it, it isn't our responsibility at this time. It's something that I keep reminding myself and thinking about that you know, our responsibility, the government slogan, whatever we might think about that has been to stay safe, stay at home, stay alert. Nowhere has it been stay thin, stay beautiful. Mm. Um, and it may be that many of us come out of lockdown having eaten in just slightly different ways for all sorts of reasons and our body might have changed in some ways for all sorts of reasons we won't be alone in that for sure and therefore I wonder if it's almost a collective opportunity really not only for ourselves to observe ourselves and to come really face to face with that and that's painful and I'm not underestimating the pain the possible pain of it but also to notice others and how um you know, our, our relationship to food can change for all sorts of reasons. And this is within the context of a clinical level of e um, eating disorder or not. You know, so many people I'm talking to are eating a little bit differently right now. Um, and, but how we, the people that we are, you know, our, our true selves, our deeper selves, will come out of this our deeper selves. Yes, we'd have had different experiences along the way and noticing that in ourselves and others, that something intrinsically and fundamentally does not change about us when things might change in terms of our eating habits and our body shape and weight and appearance. So I guess I'm holding out a really deep hope, Hannah, because whilst I'm hearing on the one hand that people are saying I'm really struggling at the moment and I hear that, you know, I've got easy access to the fridge or I've got more time to think about my body shape. I've got more time in front of the mirror. I'm being told by the media I should be spending my exercise time apportioned by the government burning calories. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the other side, I'm hearing people say I'm slowing down. I'm reflecting on things. I'm, I'm coming back to what feels fundamentally true to me and important to that deeper aspect of myself. Absolutely. And as we'll go on to talk about some of the tips and techniques to overcome some of these challenges, you know, of course, social media isn't great sometimes, but it also does serve um, a purpose and it is also really helpful for people in recovery. And there's lots of great accounts out there that can aid someone's recovery and sort of um, reiterate some of the things me and Nicole have been saying about, you know, critiquing the beauty industry and critiquing um, the salience people put on appearance. So, you know, all hope isn't lost. And of course, we know, don't we, that media, social media does not cause eating disorders. It doesn't cause BDD. These experiences have been around a lot longer than Twitter and Instagram. However, they certainly don't help. And it does feel like now might be a time to really emancipate ourselves. And yes, it's a difficult process and easier said than done. And yet it could really be a call to action in a particular way. Absolutely, Nicole. You know, like we said before, it's it's a social cultural challenge. It's just part of the puzzle. And it's more of a catalyst than a cause, I'd say. Uh, but it's a nice segue to talk about what people can do to perhaps make their social media a safer space for them during this time. So just to remind you really that you can mute certain words on Twitter and Instagram, you know, such as weight loss, blow ups, things like that, the quarantine 15, as Nicole said. But it's, it's hard, I think, to unpick at the moment social media and news and other media. So when we were talking about this, we thought about maybe limiting your exposure to news. So maybe like five, 10 minutes per day and just favor trusted sources. Um, perhaps, you know, the, the daily update or something like that, where it's, it, it's straight from the horse's mouth and information that can't be twisted. I also really like the inclusion of face acronyms. So remember to filter, avoid and refrain from comparisons and evaluate. Now, as we mentioned before, just moving on to another social cultural challenge of supermarkets and availability of food, there might be um, something that I found quite helpful and something that's used in CBT quite a lot as well, is this idea of a traffic light system. So that may be useful for you as well. And it's about having, you know, the green foods, so the foods that you're very comfortable eating and you're very comfortable um including them as part of your diet and then you've got the orange foods where it's like oh it's not the worst thing in the world but it's still going to be a bit of a challenge and then the red foods which for you you know might just be absolute no-goes so 
What I would encourage during this time is having a plan A and a plan B and really focusing on that middle section, that orange section, the amber light of a traffic light. Think about what's in there at the moment. Is there anything that you could promote from the red light to the orange light and things, you know, areas that you could maybe challenge yourself with a little bit if you go to a supermarket and the food you're expecting to get isn't available. So just sort of contingency planning and thinking about backup plans whilst we're going to the supermarket. Um, yeah, I think that's a quite a handy thing to do given the current climate. Absolutely, Hannah, absolutely. Um, and just to mention that last bullet point there at the bottom in terms of socio-cultural challenges around perhaps what might be within our religious group or our cultural group, our social group, quite acceptable norms and practices around eating. And this isn't a value judgment, because of course, um, there'll be a huge amount of um, positive aspects and connection that come from those shared experiences around food. However, you know, this might be really a time for us to think, is, is this right for me in this moment? So, you know, I can speak from my personal experience. I'm very much into yoga and I'm quite shocked sometimes by the yoga studios and the yoga magazines that might peddle, um, you know, particular diets. Hannah mentioned veganism and that can be quite a thing in the, in the sort of yoga world. So there's a sense of, well, I practice yoga quite um, passionately, let's say, and it's a big part of my life. So I have to be vegan to fit into that. And then it's separating that and thinking, well, Actually, I've, I've had a clinical level of an eating disorder. I've you know, been diagnosed with anorexia and really struggled with that in my younger years. So it does that fit with me? Is that right for me now? And it could be that years down the line when I'm feeling more comfortable with my relationship with food that I do decide to try veganism. But is that the right thing now? Or is an extended fast, even if it's part of my religious practice, right for me now and could I go to the imam or could I go to my yoga teacher or could I go to whoever it is as part of that group that have this acceptable practice and say and actually for these reasons that this isn't right for me now but I can show my devotion in another way and um, it's something that I find really helpful to think about as well. Definitely. Um, and as I mentioned to you last time Nicole part of my um, PhD study is looking at sort of cultural adaptations of these prevention strategies and um, so I've worked a little bit in East London and there's a real push in the East London community eating disorders team to work closely with the imam to understand, you know, whereas um, things like diabetes excuse you from Ramadan, perhaps an eating disorder can as well. And just looking at them both on par, I think is a yeah, it's very progressive um, thing to do at the moment, I believe. Lovely. Um, and now just looking at some of the other challenges, some of the physiological and psychological challenges. I really wanted to mention about routines and keeping routines around food and eating, however, whilst remembering to be flexible. Um, I always remember when I was in treatment, there was a cognitive remediation approach used. And um, it, it just really blew my mind because the, what was explained to me is that the rigidity that I had around food and eating um, sort of was reflected in other more mundane parts of my life. So, for example, when I went and sat on a bus, I had to sit on the exact same seat. When I did a run around the park, I had to take the exact same route. And it was really quite interesting that just tweaking those quite mundane, inflexible, rigid rules that I had did reflect actually into my eating practices. So you know, taking a different route and going down a different path on your own or sitting on a different seat when you're on the bus and showing flexibility in other parts of your life can really impact your um, flexibility around food and eating as well. So that might be something to consider. Whereas, you know, having a very strict routine might be helpful. Think about the repercussions if we couldn't do that specific thing that day and how distressed would we be? And that might be, be a sign that we need to loosen the boundaries a little bit. Um, so yeah, just keeping that balance between flexibility and inflexibility, I think is really important, especially during these times. Yeah, and I've heard that a lot from people actually saying how much they've appreciated keeping up some sort of a routine in their day, when other routines such as going out to work or other things people might have been doing haven't been possible. So having a similar time of getting up, having meal times at a similar time, and also noticing triggering points during the day. So if it's if it's, for example, we had a comment in the chat there, someone struggling with binging, you know, if you notice that 
you tend to binge in the evenings and you or you tend to binge when you're alone thinking okay I'm, I'm curious about this pattern I'm curious that this say 7 to 9 p.m at night seems to be a bit of a touchstone for me a bit of a tricky moment for me in my daily routine how can I think about that that window of time can I put a hobby in there do I need to make a phone call to a trusted person um, how can I get the emotional needs met that I'm experiencing for example that feeling of loneliness I might feel when I'm on my own in the evening in a way that isn't detrimental to my physical health in terms of perhaps then ingesting so much food that I feel later uncomfortable and, and feelings of shame around it. Um, and just on the back of that Nicole, um, a really useful tool um, in self-monitoring is the Maudsley's Rise Up app. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, but it's called Rise Up and Recover um, and that is a online food diary but rather than making note of the you know you're not keeping a recipe so you don't want to know how many calories was in everything and how many grams etc it's more like you were saying Nicole keeping track of the mood and behaviors and situations that trigger certain disordered eating patterns and it's a really good way to keep yourself accountable during these times as well so that might be of interest to some of you yeah and, and I suppose as part of that Hannah what one could do is to think about differences between physical hunger and emotional hunger so thinking about in this moment in time and we can journal about this and think about it is it is it a, a, a need for nourishment is it a need for food is it physical hunger showing up and that is different for all of us isn't it but that could be an empty feeling in the stomach it could be a, a feeling of the blood sugar becoming low um, or is it an, an emotional need? Is it that I'm feeling disconnected, numb, lonely, afraid, anxious? And these are feelings that many of us will be feeling, in, particularly at this current time. And therefore, is the need for food or is the need for some sort of um, emotional nourish, nourishment? Um, do I need to watch a funny film, pick up a heartwarming book, pick up the telephone? Um, just beginning to recognise these signals and, and how it show, how the different signals show up in the body. Um, and that might be journaling, as we said, it might be using the Rise Up app, keeping a food diary and monitoring those feelings and experiences. And then thinking about then how we respond to those needs that are showing up. So if it's, if it's a, we might have a little list, you know, if we decided, okay, it's more of an emotional need right now, have a little list of things that I do when I'm feeling lonely, when I'm feeling anxious, whilst acknowledging that food isn't just functional. We all eat for emotional reasons. We all eat because it's pleasurable to eat. We all eat sometimes because we fancy a bit of chocolate, not because we have a physical hunger for a bit of chocolate. So it's of course encompassing all of that. But then also if it's, if it's a physical need for nourishment, thinking, well, what will nourish me right now? And you know, what might make me feel good in the short term? But actually in two hours time after I've taken in this meal, how will I feel then? So sometimes it's having a bit of a longer term view because that can support us to think about foods that truly nourish us and truly keep us feeling satiated and, and support our body in the best possible way. Um, and I just wanted to mention as well, Hannah, this idea about basic needs. It sounds easy to say, doesn't it? But you know, simple things like making sure it's simple, it isn't simple, but, um, you know getting enough sleep and even cl clothing is so important um, and I re it really breaks my heart when I hear people say oh I've got this size whatever pair of trousers in my cupboard because I'm, I'm, I'm working towards the day when I'll fit into them again let's throw those trousers out and if there's a pair of clothes or a piece of clothing that, that doesn't fit you or you feel uncomfortable in or you feel every time you wear it you, you you don't like the way your body looks or feels let's let's pop it in a bag for the charity shop or in, into the bin that you know and I know that there may be um, financial implications for that for us but there will hopefully be some clothes we're more comfortable in than others so let's give ourselves the best possible opportunity and consider throwing those weighing scales in the bin you know we can't measure our worth and who we are um, with a pair of bathroom scales. Thank you, Nicole. That's perfect segue into the next slide, I think. <clears throat> Brilliant. So the next slide talks a lot about um, your area of expertise, I believe. So using soothing approaches and self-compassion and mindfulness techniques. Would you mind sharing your expertise a little bit with us there? 
Thank you, Hannah. Um, I think this is just some other little tips really to try out. And of course, we all have a different sensory profile and we all have a unique nervous system. So it really is very much trying things out and seeing what feels good and what works for us. So thinking of things that soothe us, thinking again of the idea of hyperarousal and hyperarousal anxiety and, and low mood states. What, what brings us down when we're feeling anxious? Um, could it be that hot bath or that um, loving to candle or wrapping ourselves tightly into a blanket? What brings us up when we're feeling low in mood? You know, could it be dancing around to a funky tune or um, having, having a, a spicy herbal tea or you know something to, to pep us up? Um, also something that's really important and actually it came up just now in the Q&A so it's probably a good time to mention it is, is thinking about underlying medical needs as well because this can really perpetuate an experience like both um, eating struggles and body dysmorphic disorder. So if there are digestive issues there and we also know don't we that eating struggles can themselves lead to digestive difficulties so it can become a cyclical relationship. Being, being open about those and addressing those as part of um, the treatment and if, if we're loved ones supporting people struggling with this really taking that on board as part of the experience we've really got to listen to people and I think we've got to move beyond this um, very sad state of affairs sometimes that happens I'm sorry to say in psychiatry and in um, treatment even that there's a sense of no this is the meal plan and you've got to stick to the meal plan and then you've got a stomach ache where you need to get over it no, we're all different. And if, if a food or a certain plan or a certain protocol doesn't suit your body, let's be open about that and support um, ourselves and others to find another way. Um, and then mindfulness techniques is just something else to mention there and including self-compassionate practices as well. Um, so this is not to say that mindfulness is a cure-all. And actually, if we've had experiences of a traumatic nature some experiences like meditation might be quite uncomfortable and difficult for us and we close our eyes and we might end up with these flashbacks of some of those difficult experiences so it's being gentle with ourselves not using it as another stick to beat ourselves with oh I can't even do mindfulness I can't even stay in the present moment no but trying out all the stuff that's out there and it's very on vogue at the moment so there's loads of stuff out there for mindfulness to see what works for us and if connecting to the breath isn't soothing then perhaps we can connect to the heartbeat or perhaps we can visualize or perhaps we can do a movement practice like yoga um, but really being willing to experiment a little bit and Rob gave a lovely webinar at the beginning of this series about attentional refocusing so very much coming into the present moment focusing the minds away from the thoughts particularly um, rumination type thoughts away from difficult sensations in the body and towards something in the environment a smell a sound um, an object of reference if you like in the environment and that's not to um, distract ourselves or um, well it can be momentarily and we all might need momentary distraction but it's not to deny our experience it's just to come to that place of regulation from which we might th then be able to explore some of our diff difficult experiences with more um, capacity for tolerance and more compassion for ourselves. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was really insightful. And I think um, it made me think when you were talking about yoga, about one of the questions we've just received in the Q&A about exercise. And I think it's probably worth um, just spending a moment thinking about exercise in the current context. I think as you mentioned before, you know, we're encouraged by the government to go out and exercise, but for someone who may have a tendency to use exercise as a purging mechanism, that could be quite dangerous. And I think over-exercise is something that I've definitely struggled with during these times. I think what started off as a distraction technique turned into something with more of a sinister motivation. Um, and I think that's a really tricky thing to navigate. I think in terms of um, how, I've, how I've managed that and how I have navigated that, there are some really excellent practitioners out there who, who work with people with body image difficulties and eating difficulties and 
I would really recommend going out and researching some of those practitioners because exercise can be used to nourish your body, not just punish it, which is something we learn, I think, with um, disordered eating. And as well, find practitioners who use body functionality approaches. So are more bothered about how, how movement affects your physiology rather than how it affects your appearance. So for example, a PT I work with, she's um, got a name very similar to mine. She's called Hannah Lewin. There's only one letter different, which I find fascinating. Um, she uses a very um, body functionality approach and the only compliment she'll ever give me is not how, on how I look, but more about my mobility, my flexibility, my speed, you know, those really tangible um, things to do with physical activity that we sometimes forget about when we're when we're exercising for the sake of our appearance and to lose weight and to burn calories. Um, I think I was telling Nicole last time we spoke, there was some really interesting research on this that actually showed that practitioners who use body functionality approaches as opposed to talking about burning calories and burning fats and things like that um, ended up having participants with higher levels of body satisfaction. So, it, I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? And I think it's definitely something I'd encourage you to, um, to look at. There's also another th um, thing I've found recently in lockdown is a body positive dance class. And that's really mm -hmm. an, a, another thing like yoga that's just really great in terms of embodiment and using exercise as a way to nourish your body and feel good rather than punish yourself and feel not so good. Um, and that leads us quite nicely onto another question that we've had. You'll notice I've just figured out how to find the Q&As. So that's why I've got all the questions up now. Um, and it's the comment made around um, someone who is deemed clinically obese by BMI standards. Um, and I think this is a really important topic to cover because as mentioned previously, public health initiatives and the government really does, you know, really does invest a lot of shame and emotion into weight and obesity and I don't think that's the best public health approach to be honest um and I think it's firstly it's really important to acknowledge that BMI isn't a great indicator of health and that health goes beyond your body shape and size as we mentioned before um in terms of accessing ED support yeah, I think the other part of that question might be a bit too specific to the individual, but yeah, just wanted to just wanted to comment on um, BMI and obesity and things like that. Definitely difficult during this time, as we mentioned before about the quarantine fifteen, which I've actually not heard of. So. Thank you for that question. And it is a social construct. Oh. All of this, all of the diagnoses are social constructs, and obesity is a social construct so it's really thinking about that okay this is a label that's been attributed to me using a very arbitrary measure like bmi um, that we know for people with different body frames and heights really isn't at all um, accurate anyway never mind being valid in terms of what it actually tells us um, i think it's really important to be critical and cast a critical eye over some of these social constructs and social, social concepts um, and the way that they're used to shame and the way that they're used to um, say something about people, about their personality or their, um, their selves, really, that says nothing about personality or self. There, there really is a huge societal discourse around appearance, weight, shape, and what it means to be a human being and what that says about us as a human being. And the two things have nothing to do with each other as, as far as I'm concerned. So holding all of that in mind really, and I think we can only really call these experiences disordered if we can decide that society itself isn't disordered around these concepts of weight, shape and food and size. And we cannot say it we only have to look to our media or, e or even some of the laws that we have and some of the ways in which we um, decide on treatment to know that society is, is a bit disordered um, around appearance. And that isn't our fault. And it is something that we can um, collectively come together and do something about, I think. 
Um, we, we, we do have agency in this, however much it might feel like um, that we don't at times. So okay. we've, we've got some key messages um, to take away and then we'll have a look at some of the questions, which I think some of them might have been covered as part of the things we've just gone over. But um, we really, really, really wanted to emphasise this aspect of, of addressing the physiological too because we know that this is, these are struggles that are emotional in nature. And even though the distress might be projected onto the physical appearance, this is not about physical appearance. However, these experiences can have quite severe physiological ramifications. So if you are struggling, or if you know somebody that's struggling, really um, making a priority to go to a medical practitioner and have, have yourself checked out and have any underlying medical needs addressed. Definitely. We also, after today's talk, really wanted to emphasise the importance of not pathologising all of our behaviours during this time. You know, for some of us, we might be falling back into old coping mechanisms because it's a default and this is a really tricky time. So we don't want to make everyone go away from today in panic and think they've got a clinical eating disorder we just wanted to you know reiterate that these experiences should be taken seriously absolutely um and then considering all the range of ways that we can meet our needs so noticing that if we're going towards something in a, in an attempt to self-regulate that isn't serving us so for example as a comment that um, came up in the chat that we're we're exercising excessively and that isn't serving us because it's fatiguing us it's stopping us doing other things that we enjoy doing perhaps we're even getting injuries from overusing the body in this way looking at okay how else can i regulate myself um, how else can I bring myself up or down? And there can be a myriad of ways thinking about um, you know, some of the things we've mentioned, but also um, how do we make those social connections to soothe ourselves, including in this time? And we have um, different means of doing that or um, even simple breathing techniques, simple mindfulness techniques, extending the exhalation to bring ourselves down, extending the inhalation to bring ourselves up. Um, and self-compassion, and this is where going back to books, for example, by Paul Gilbert, um, who's done a lot of work with Professor Veal actually, also related to BDD, so he has a good knowledge of this topic area, and there's a video of one of his talks at the BDD Foundation conferences, it's absolutely excellent, speaking to ourselves kindly, noticing the inner dialogue that we're having, stopping ourselves, considering would I speak this way to somebody that I love? experimenting with putting some of those thoughts into the third person so rather than I'm so stupid you know, oh Nicole is so stupid and separating that out and thinking well that isn't my voice actually that's society's voice it might be a parental voice it might be a teacher's voice it's come from somewhere but it doesn't come from our heart and the voice that comes from our heart is the sort of voice that says to us you're in a global pandemic, mate. It's okay that you're freaking out a bit and eating a lot of chocolate at the moment, or um, you're doing the best you can right now, you know, or okay, that was that was a tricky day and you did some things that, that didn't serve you in terms of your health. Tomorrow is a fresh start and tomorrow we'll try again. Definitely. Like I said before, there's no right and wrong way to navigate a pandemic. We're all just doing the best we can. Um, so I think that's a really important message to take away. Thank you. And as well as being kind to ourselves, you know, be kind, accept kindness from others and um, reach out to those you trust for support and share some of your um, current difficulties. There's some resources on the next page which have great um, resources to support carers, parents. So that might be something that you want to share with those close to you. And this final point, it's really important for, I think, anyone who's previously um, experienced psychological distress or been in treatment for one of the conditions we've covered today. And it's this idea of relapse. And I think it can be a really scary prospect um, to be thrown into such a triggering situation like this pandemic after, after experiencing psychological distress in the past. Because I think when we do go to old coping mechanisms, that could be a bit of a red flag and we might think that we're relapsing. But I think it's important to separate out what the word relapse actually means. And, you know, 
this idea that there's a lapse, there's a relapse and there's a collapse. So a lapse is maybe, you know, one behavior that you that you fall back on as a way to cope. And it's an isolated incident and you have the insight to acknowledge that it maybe didn't serve you the way it used to. And maybe we can look for more um, more useful coping strategies, more positive coping techniques. A relapse is when that that old coping mechanism, that um, problematic behavior gets repeated a few times and you find yourself using it as a crutch again, like you used to. Again, it's, it's okay to acknowledge that and just take a step back and understand that this is a, a very triggering time and you might go to old coping mechanisms, but watch out for that collapse because that's probably the pre-treatment situation that you were in. And it's important to let's try not to get there again because then we might be in a little bit of trouble. But even if you do, consider all the things that Nicole just said about being kind to yourself and embodying that self-compassion and being able to address those medical and physical needs as well as your psychological needs um, and using the resources on the next page to help yourself and reach out for others to help you as well. Okay. We just wanted to very briefly touch on and then we'll just have a look at any questions that haven't been covered in what we've said is if you've come along because you're worried about a loved one um, and they aren't mutually ex exclusive of course because sometimes when we move in these circles we might be struggling ourselves and also have friends and peers that are struggling um, to come to really go to the BDD Foundation website go to the B web website and arm yourself with resources and understanding keep that curiosity and openness and non-judgment sharing concerns but really staying with the underlying distress rather than the focus on appearance because even something ask or oh, you've you look like you've lost weight can be quite triggering and triggering and put the defense up whereas something like you seem to be quite sad i'm quite worried about you might be an opener that might then lead to other conversations about other aspects of that person's experience even things like you look well can for a person be taken up as i look like i've put on weight so sort of leaving aside the, the aspect of the physical appearance, but more talking about the underlying distress. Signposting, offering to go along to appointments to support can be wonderful uh, for people that are struggling. And then it's hard to watch someone struggle. It's so hard to see somebody not feeding themselves properly or, or agonizing in front of the mirror for, for hours a day and just recognizing that, that is incredibly painful and therefore you may need of course your own self-care um, as paramount but also possibly your own support as well lovely and of course you can always access our bdd foundation support groups which are currently all online um, as well as the be online support groups and helplines um, both of those, both of the organisations will have um, resources, like I said, for people currently struggling, but also the parents and carers as well. Then do we talk about Eat, Breathe, Thrive? Yeah, um, that's a lovely organisation. I, I, well, I'm very biased. I'm a facilitator of the programme. It really is a wonderful organisation and it combines um, practices of yoga and mindfulness with psychoeducation around food and body image struggles. And a lot of their stuff has gone online now. So worth worth looking them up and seeing if there might be something there that could be supportive for you. Definitely. And although we've got loads of self-help stuff and um, loads of books, podcasts, and exercises like mindfulness and self-compassion to um, recommend for you. Do disclose any difficulties you're having to your care team or your GP so treatment can be integrated. Um, I know that's easier said than done right now, but there are ways to still access help, maybe more online, maybe more remote, um, but it's important to still get those referrals while you can. And here are some of the self-help resources we covered. Um, there's the Beaten BDD podcast and of course our website, uh, the book Reflections on Body Dysmorphic Disorder that the foundation um, published a couple of years ago now, wasn't it, Nicole? Mm -hmm. And of course the Overcoming series written by David, Rob and Alex. And as um, Nicole mentioned earlier, all of Paul Gilbert's work on the Compassionate Mind is really, really helpful right now and highly recommended. 
Thank you, Hannah. So we'll stop sharing the screen. And um, we've, we've really loved being here. We well, certainly really loved being here with you this evening. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, a little bit. Sorry. I'm sorry we've overran a little bit, haven't we? Lots to say. Lots to say, Hannah. Um, that's okay. I mean, we just have, I think most of the questions we've in some way covered and please be assured that we really do take questions to heart and we have an ongoing webinar series and we'll consider how they can be woven in. So for example, Kitty's also kindly put there in the chat that we're looking into having a, a session um, a webinar on self-compassion. I'll definitely be coming along to that one. Um, so we will we'll really try and respond to any requests that you might have. Um, we have a few more comments around obesity. And that is a very difficult one, particularly feelings of shame and embarrassment around one's body. And I guess this doesn't just go for obesity, but any shame and embarrassment that one feels about one's body that is very much part and parcel very often of an experience like body dysmorphic disorder and, uh, and, and eating disorders. And it's tough. It's tough. And it doesn't go away overnight over either. You know, some people might have a, a, a real moment and a sense of it lifting, but more likely it is that these feelings of shame that we have about our body with a lot of hard work, with a lot of work on our self-compassion, with being very curious about our experiences, addressing any previous traumatic experiences that we've had, really thinking about and feeling about our self-concept how we feel about who we are, bolstering our own self-esteem, finding things in, within us to love, that this shame gradually reduces and reduces. And part of that is acknowledging the shame as well, not pushing it down, not pushing it away um, or um, demonising it in some way, but seeing it as part of our experience and part of our story and seeing if we can even find a bit of compassion for that shameful part of ourselves. And, and giving that bit of compassion to those very tricky aspects of ourselves can help those parts of ourselves to relax actually. And then other aspects that actually perhaps could really connect with the felt sense of goodness within ourselves have got more space to emerge. And then we might find ourselves walking down the road feeling a bit less shameful than, than we felt before. That's uh, brilliant. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Um, and I'm so sorry to, to read this as well, and, and I but assure you that you're not alone in terms of perhaps partners or friends, family members making comments on our appearance like, oh, you look like you've put on weight or, um, or your skin doesn't look as clear as it did yesterday or whatever it is that then triggers us to feel that experience of shame. And I guess it's, it's recognising that we have a bias in our mind towards comments that sound potentially rejecting so it could be a hundred people tell us something positive about our appearance and then we have one thing that we take as meaning we could possibly be rejected and that smoke alarm part of our brain fires and we're suddenly in that fight flight and freeze mode and we just feel absolutely bereft so it's kind of recognizing that that we're kind of geared towards being hyper aware of comments like that sometimes it part of that and it takes courage is sitting down with a person and saying um, I know perhaps you might be making this as a throwaway comment but when you say this I feel this and staying with our feelings and being honest about how those comments make us feel um, and then recognizing that no person's summation of our physical appearance or our being is is ever going to be a comprehensive um, or even truthful necessarily um, understanding of, of who we are and then perhaps going away and thinking about all the other aspects of ourselves um, that may well have also been picked up by that person but we've lost in that moment because we're focused on that tricky bit but maybe also um, we know in our hearts to be true even if others haven't told us and the more we in again increase that self-compassion and self-knowledge uh, self-love really and that's a big word to say isn't it but it is possible to gradually gradually find ways to love and respect ourselves the more these comments um, are likely to not have such fertile ground to, to grow upon definitely and I think that point you made about hyper awareness really lends itself well to a couple of comments that have just come through about how that lack of routine and lack of social cont contact have really um 
catalyze people's feelings about their relationship with the body and the relationship with food. I don't know about you, but I, I definitely felt just due to the, the lack of stimulation and boredness that I was experiencing, I did, I did just feel like my brain went back into the default mode because um, it's what it's used to. So it just takes that little bit more of an effort to be like, oh, hang on a minute, you don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> um, so that's you know something I really empathize with. Thank you for sharing those points. Um, yeah, you mentioned they're reverting back to how you were previously. And I think that is something that we've discussed, isn't it, Nicole, and something that we shouldn't be ashamed of. Um, you know, it's not maladaptive, it's just adaptive. We're just trying to navigate these difficult situations in the ways we know work for us or have worked in the past. Um, but it's about establishing that they may not work for us or serve us in the best way now. And we have more resources than we had before, even if we feel like we've gone back to square one, we never really have, because since the last time we felt that we were at square one, we've had other experiences, we've got other things probably in our toolkit to help us, so it's not the case that it will take us just as long to get to where we were before from square one, um, from where we are now, so it's also recognising that we, we, um, we have that capacity and that ability to, 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 to rise up again and to come back from any slipbacks and that slipbacks may indeed be more possible at the moment. That's understandable, we're not alone in, alone in them um, and we can um, make our way back from them. Okay, Brilliant. thank you. It's been a real pleasure to spend this evening with you. Thank you for coming along and for asking so many really provocative and helpful questions for us to think about and reflect on. We hope you'll join us for some other webinars in the series and go to the Business Foundation website, watch some of the videos from past conferences, listen to the podcasts and find a whole host of resources to support you during this time. Brilliant. Thank you everyone so much. Everyone take care and look after yourselves and hopefully speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah.